So uh, uh, I'm going to talk about nine rules for scientific libraries in Rust. I'm a retired applied uh, researcher from Microsoft, and over my time there, I uh, got to create uh, many scientific libraries in uh, many languages. Um, I'm going to be talking specifically about lessons learned from a, a, a library called Bed Reader. It's an open source library for reading a genomics uh, data format, and it's part of a bigger project called uh, FastLim uh, that involves uh, uh, genome-wide association studies. I'm going to go really fast, but everything here refers to articles, uh, basically blog posts that I have on uh, medium.com, and you can uh, look those up for all kinds of additional details. And finally, I'm calling these rules for creating your scientific libraries, but of course, I just don't want to be wishy-washy. You can, can just consider these suggestions. So going to the first rule, I uh, want to encourage you to support not just Rust when you create a scientific library with Rust, but also to create Python. Uh, we, we know we, why we have Rust. We want correctness and speed and concurrency, um, but Python is where the scientists are. So if you want to have the biggest impact, be sure to include Python. And one example to quantify this is BedReader. Um, the all-time number of downloads from BedReader in Rust is about 41,000. In a good month, the Python version of BedReader which calls the Rust version uh, in a good month gets 50,000. Uh, by putting them together, you really do get the best of both worlds. And as we've already had several uh, references to, the tools for putting them together is quite good. Py03, Matron, uh, I encourage you to keep everything in one uh, repo and have everything in one uh, build system. And for some details on this, uh, there's the article is uh, nine rules for writing Python extensions in Rust. Rule two, uh, aspire to make your API as nice as it would be in Python. Uh, recall that an API is stands for application program interface. It's the functions and other things that your library provides to your users uh, publicly. So uh, let me, here's an example of reading uh, a genomics file in Python. We open with a file name. We ask for the first five user IDs. We print the first five DNA locations. We list all the chromosome uh, values that we see in the file. And then we do a read of the genomic data, but only at the places where chromosome is five. Here's the same uh, problem solved with Rust, with the Rust API. We open the file. Again, we can uh, read just five IDs, five DNA locations. We can get all of the uh, unique chromosomes, and we can do the same kind of uh, slicing reader where we only read from DNA locations within chromosome five. The trick to doing this is to use a builder pattern in Rust to kind of mimic keyword arguments that are available in Python, and then just to do the extra work to support the things that uh, users in Python have come to expect, indexing, ranges, masks, slices, and then also to try to be permissive. If you accept a file name as a path, also accept it as a string. If you accept uh, a vector of numbers, uh, make that more general and uh, make it so you will also accept a, say, a 1D, a one-dimensional ND array. Uh, and some details on how to do all this is in the article, uh, Nine Rules for Elegant Rust Library APIs. Uh, rule three, uh, think about if you want to support not just reading from local files, but also reading from the cloud. And that could include uh, not just whole files, but reading chunks. And the most popular library and powerful library for doing this is Object Store, uh, the crate. I also created a little wrapper around it called CloudFile that I thought made it a little easier to use. With this, your users will be able to use URLs to read from all the different cloud providers and just from web pages. And importantly, if you have big data files, you don't have to read the whole file. You can also, users will also be able to read uh, just uh, parts of a file. And uh, you can see things, the code looks almost the same. 
except now the user passes in uh, a URL and then uh, there can be an option for some additional uh, uh, parameters that are sometimes appropriate. Rule four is the async question. We always wanna know whether we should support async or not when we have uh, long processes, for example, reading from a cloud file. The way I come down on this now is that on Rust, I recommend you do support async for processes that might be slow, like a, a read. On Python, I, changed, I decided not to um, provide the user support with async. Uh, so when a user in Python does a read, it's calling Rust code that's async, but then the async code just waits until the read completes. So from the Python user's point of view, they don't have to worry about async. And I think that's just because uh, I don't think Python users want to want to deal with async. Uh, there's an article, uh, Nine Rules for Accessing Cloud Files uh, from your Rust uh, code. Rule five, I'll skip over uh, very quickly in the interest of time. But if you are going to provide features like support for Python or support for cloud reading, I recommend making uh, gating them by uh, using uh, cargo features so users don't have to um, include all the code required to support those features if they don't want to. Uh, so all this was about making your uh, library nice, but we also want to make it efficient. Uh, several speakers have already talked about Rayon. It's a wonderful way to accelerate code, especially things having to do arrays, uh, because it handles delightfully parallel problems uh, delightfully well. Uh, one prob one example where it's used in bed reader is in bed reader where uh, we serially read the data off the disk because that's the fastest way to read data off the disk. But the data was compressed on the disk and we would need to decompress it. So we can decompress all the data for a, uh, a DNA location uh, in for like 16 DNA locations at once. And that can give us a, a nice speed up. And this is just an example of that code. We just call some uh, um, a parallel operator. And uh, in this example, we're also collecting and reporting back uh, any errors we get. Uh, I'll go over, <laughs> I have a SIMD uh, recommendation too. We just, uh, two talks ago, um, heard about that. Uh, I've had good luck even running SIMD, uh, uh, portable SIMD on WASM, along with AMD and ARM. I was getting a seven times speed up on a data structure crate and a Turing machine visualizer. Uh, for me, the only downside to the portable SIMD is that it's uh, nightly only. And as far as I know, there's no definite plans to make it stable, but it, it's really quite wonderful. And for an article, on uh, kind of step-by-step -step advice on how to use it. Uh, look at SIMD acceleration of your uh, Rust code. Uh, one of the most important rules <laughs> is to write good documentation. And the reason to write good documentation isn't just so your users can read uh, what they should do, but also it helps keep your design of your library honest. So specifically, please write real documentation for every public function. Uh, if at all possible, include an example in that documentation and make that example a doc test so that it will really become uh, uh, part of your tests. If you find it too hard to write an example for one of your functions that users are expected to use, then that might be a sign that you your library itself is awkward uh, and could be a, improved to be uh, less awkward. And this is an example of the uh, function that uh, lists the chromosomes from uh, that are available in a uh, genomics data set. And here's an example showing how someone can use the chromosomes. And that's detailed in uh, rule five on the elegant uh, Rust library APIs article. Uh, and the final rule is to not just run tests, but make sure all your tests are being done in continuous integration, uh, CI. 
Uh, my motto here is, is if a test isn't in continuous integration, if it's not CI, then it's not real. Uh, and specifically, uh, what I use is GitHub Actions. Um, so you can do your Rust test, your doc test, your Python test. If you have cargo features, you can test with all of them on and all of them off. You can test that it really runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows, that it works on ARM and uh, x64. I even have uh, one project that's testing that it runs OK on x uh, on 32 bit. Um, Carl, yeah. um, you, your time is up, so it'd be best if you could wrap up quickly. Okay. Thank and you. that's the last slide. So uh, correctness, usability, and performance. And uh, here's links to the uh, articles. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle asks, regarding rule six and seven, are SIMD and Rayon mutually exclusive within the same part of the code or should we aim to apply them in different parts? Uh, let's see. They're not mutually exclusive. Actually, they should work. One of the great things about SIMD is it makes everybody's everything on with SIMD is running on one processor. So there's no reason that Rayon can't be distributing SIMD jobs and do a great job of it. 